Okay, welcome to uh, my talk uh, about the myths and realities uh, on uh, Android machine learning. Uh, my name is Hoi. Uh, I lead the developer relations team at Google uh, on the topic of Android uh, machine learning. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, my handle is HoiTab, H-O-I-T-A-B. So please do. All right. So I thought, hey, you know, there is so much to talk about about Android. Let me do the corporate color presentation about the TensorFlow, the ML Kit, and the Android platform. But I go, well, actually, that that's a bit boring. So I thought, why don't I talk about some of the myths that I have um, heard, you know, heard of uh, when I was, when I'm talking to developers, developers like yourself uh, and like myself. About 12 months ago, I thought, hey. Machine learning is not really for me because of reason X. So why don't we go through the myths, and I will share with you what I learned uh, about machine learning. Because I'm also new, so I only come into this role last November, and then 12 months ago I was still like an enthusiast. I was doing kind of you know bits and bobs, but nothing uh, like my main job. So what have I actually learned since November? Um, so here comes the first myth: is, hey, Android is just simply not powerful enough to run machine learning. You know, it's a phone with a very limited battery. How can it possibly run machine learning? And you know, this is not just you, and this is not just me that's thinking about that. But the whole industry, when you look at how machine learning is presented, is often like this. It's like, oh my God! You know, you need your gigaflops, you need your petaflops of processing power in order to do machine learning. And yes, these have its place. So when you're trying to train a model, you know, from scratch with millions and billions of data points, then yes, many of these will be very, very helpful. And my colleagues at Google Cloud would quite like you to use their product. However, that is only the first part of machine learning, the training part. So when you're creating the model, so once you have trained your model, there are two other parts that you can get started right now today. The second part is what we call inference, which is running the trained model, and then the last part, which we all know as Android developers, is deployment. It's no good to just kind of, you know, put it into your app. You actually need to deploy it, and there are various options to do that. So starting today, Android developers could actually concentrate on the last two. But don't worry, that is not the end of my talk. So how do you do kind of all these different parts?、Um, let's kick off with a live demo. Let's see if I could do this. Ah, that's not very live. Switch. Okay, not that demo yet. All right. So. Okay. So just to demonstrate the power of Android on device machine learning,、um, I have with me a Pixel phone, and right now it's doing live inference of where my eyes are,、uh, where my mouth is,、uh, where my nose is,、um, etc. In real time. So you can imagine that as developers yourself, you could kind of put funny stickers on me, you know, a beard, maybe, you know, a Santa hat. All of that is possible、uh, for Android developers. So this is just a brief、um, demo of the power of live on-device machine learning. Okay. So that was very brief. Let's go back to the other window. Ah, whoops! The other way. Yay! Okay, maybe next time I can do better. Cool.、Um, so, apart from the machine learning part, there was another part that we learn as we、um, kind of perform on-device machine learning、uh, on an Android phone. One of them is actually the design of your program and how you structure it. So, if you look at、um, this particular demo, this is run on a Lexus 5X. I was running it on a Pixel 3. So, the Pixel 
absolutely fine. On a 5x, you're getting about you know, 5, maybe 10 frames uh, per second. And if you move drastically around, then the uh, image, the, the analysis may not actually follow you. If you're rendering uh, your result on one layer and have a camera preview on another layer. So what we have found is that um, if you um, actually don't display the camera preview until the analysis is done, then the user actually don't perceive um, the, derogation, the derogation of, or the reduction, let me just put it that way, reduction of uh, the, the system performance, but instead they see you know, perfect alignment between you know, what you're trying to draw uh, with their own face. So one of the tips for Android developers is you know, if you're doing anything with image analysis, then try to draw your result on top of the actual uh, frame that you're doing the analysis on. And that's something that I would say Android developers know, your machine learning colleague might not. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing uh, to do with design, so this is the uh, first uh, simplified Chinese on-device machine learning model that uh, Google have deployed and is on uh, Wear OS, whereby it can do the smart reply and provide you with uh, possible options uh, uh, on, a, uh, on a single tab. And here, the design lesson that we've learned is if you could um, reply with not just one answer, but perhaps you know, the top three or the top five, maybe that's something that's more sensible uh, to aim for. In this, particular, in this particular use case, you, know, you don't always say yes or no to a question. You might say yes or no. So it just makes sense to, to have the top three or the top five answers. The other thing about having not just a single answer, but multiple answers, is that your model can then be much simpler. So instead of aiming for one thing and do a lot of computation to come up with that one thing that you're going to talk about, you can actually say, hey, is it A or B or C? And in those cases, your model could actually be uh, a lot simpler and a lot smaller. So that's what we have done there. So myth number two, um, all machine learning must be done by PhD. You know, no one else should be doing this. And I don't have a PhD. I don't know how many of you do. And if you do, we do value you, so don't walk out of this talk. We do like PhDs. But at the same time, um, it is not a requirement uh, for a lot of the uh, machine learning that you uh, learn about today. Um, so here is where I will differentiate. So there are uh, well-trodden uh, paths, so well-known machine learning models on the one side. And then there are the really novel ones. So if you're saying, hey, I'm going to build the best noise cancellation machine learning algorithm, then yes, go ahead, and you will probably need a PhD. But then on the other hand, if you're trying to do image labeling, actually a lot of people have done work in that area. Why don't you kind of have a look at what they have done? So let me give you uh, some examples. The first one is around uh, the thing that I've just demonstrated, MLKit, and um, it's Google's uh, machine learning SDK for mobile. Um, in this case, you don't need to know machine learning at all. You just need to know your use case, and then you use it like any Android library. The other thing at an Android conference is to talk about we also support iOS. Um, so this particular framework uh, for, uh, that is MLKit support both Android and iOS. So even if you have an iOS app, you can also use it. And um, here are the different uh, functionality that um, have been launched. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight two of them that are new from last I.O. to this I.O. So uh, Q4 last year, we launched uh, something called Face Contour. So um, when it was first launched uh, back in I.O. last year, uh, all the API can do is detect, detect the face. But as you have seen kind of just now on a, at the demo, uh, is now able to differentiate between the different uh, um, uh, kind of characteristics of your face, including the eye or the nose or the mouth, um, et cetera. So that's basically the, the new functionality that has been launched in Q4 last year. The other thing that has been launched just, actually I think it's this month, uh, is Smart Replies. So we have built Smart Replies into uh, Wear OS, but now you can actually access uh, the same model that we use uh, for smart replies within your app. And the other thing that we have done, and the reason why it has taken so long is 
uh, we actually uh, done some extra work. So for this one, I won't do a live demo, but come, you know, come to me afterwards if you want to have a go. Um, I've actually coded something. Um, it's basically just a very simple sample app where you type in a question and it will kind of give you the possible results. So if you ask, hey, should I take that job at Google? Uh, it would say, no, sure, yeah. Um, so that's sensible kind of results. But the magic for me is actually the second one where if you give it a controversial topic, let's say to do with politics uh, in this case, or in other cases like you know, uh, family situation, the model hopefully will be smart enough to say, oh, actually, I better not suggest anything here. Um, so that's the thing that took us another couple of months uh, before launch. So this was ready kind of back in Q4 last year, but we actually took a couple more months to just um, uh, basically code up this second functionality whereby we don't want to give replies in some situation. Um, so do check it out. And then um, another thing that you will notice is uh, underneath each one of these, it has a phone or a cloud. And what that means is um, that some of the APIs support uh, both on device inference and also maybe on cloud inference. You might, argue, you, know, you might ask, hey, what is the difference? And let's take image labeling, for example. Um, so if you are doing um, the image labeling on device, then the latency is very low. And as a result, you can actually do it real time. But if you are trying to do it in the cloud, then yes, you know, regardless of how good or how close you are to a Google data center, it's going to take time. So it's unlikely that you will be able to have a live experience. It's much more likely that you have an async kind of experience. Um, you can compare the number of labels, 400 against 10,000. And that's also something that you should consider when you have, you know, let's say, a machine learning use case, whether you want to deploy it in the cloud, where you could deploy a much bigger, much more complex model uh, to maybe a simpler one uh, that you can get back to the user quickly. Um, what we care about a lot here in Europe, uh, privacy. So on the, uh, on, uh, if you're doing something on device, then the data stays on device. Whereas if you want to do the analysis in the cloud, then of course you need to send a copy of your data to the cloud. Um, and then finally, whether it's free or not, um, because if you're using the on-device machine learning, then you're essentially uh, using the user's uh, phone's processing power and battery, and as a result, free from a developer perspective, but if you want to process it either on you know, kind of Google data center or some other cloud provider, then there will be quotas or you know, metered uh, processing power. So um, when you are thinking about you know, a particular use case, think about kind of some of these uh, situation. For me, the, uh, the, the, the the top one that jumps out is, the, um, is actually the top one, uh, where you say low latency. Because from my perspective, is that if you can do things on device, then you can offer a live experience to the user. The user don't need to wait for, your da for the data to be sent to the, to the cloud and then come back. So it offers a very different user experience compared to the cloud. And to me, that's at least, you know, that's the, that's the key kind of choice uh, that you need to make. Um, maybe in conjunction with your designer and product manager. So the next thing that I'm going to kind of just quickly go over is basically the ease of use. So I mentioned that you don't need a PhD and you don't need to know about uh, machine learning uh, to use this. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to go through the four, uh, the four steps uh, to use the image labeling API. So in code, uh, very quickly, the first one is uh, basically you create a configuration object. Um, and here I set the confidence threshold of at 50%, 0.5 float. That's what it meant. Second is that I'm creating a uh, Firebase image object. So you can do it from bitmap, you can do it from camera 2, you can do it from byte array, um, anything that you want, e essentially, uh, and put it in there. But the one thing that you do need to um, uh, take care of is the orientation of the image. So if, you, um, if, if your image is rotated, then please tell us uh, whether it is rotated at 90, 180, or 270 degrees. So by default, we assume that it's upright. 
Um, next, um, we just need to get an instance of the Firebase Vision service, essentially. And then last but not least, um, basically the on success and on failure. So what happened if we detect something, you know, what do we update? So that's basically the four steps to use it. Quite simple, and everyone uh, that's coding Android should be able to use this. Next, so apart from the uh, Firebase services, um, the other thing that I've not heard a lot of people talk about are what is offered by uh, the Android platform itself. So, second demo. Okay, let's see if I can try to not to mess this up. Okay. Speech demo. I'm really happy to be here in Paris. So that's the um, speech recognizer API that you can use as an Android developer. And let me uh, show you the text-to-speech kind of reading back the other way around. And I'll hold it close to the microphone. I'm really happy to be here in Paris. So as you can hear, um, you, you don't actually need to basically have your dictation model um, or your um, uh, text-to-speech model in order to use this. This is built into the Android platform. So I thought today, hey, since I'm in Paris, why don't I just change my code uh, and switch into another language? So I thought I would try something different. Bonjour, Paris. So this also supports French. Bonjour, Paris. And it even kind of speaks with, uh, with a slight French accent uh, to it as well. And just to show that this is not kind of just some magic. Let me kind of switch it back to English and say the same thing again. Bonjour Paris. Oh, no, that didn't work. Okay, try again. Bonjour Paris. So it would try to dictate it in English uh, when I switch it back. Maybe the middle one didn't quite uh, switch it back. So just to show you, kind of, this is supporting a uh, multiple language. And it actually includes um, language that, to be honest, I wouldn't quite expect it to support. Um, so I am a native Cantonese speaker, um, a language that's only really spoken in Hong Kong, which is a city of 7 to 8 billion people, um, and maybe a bit of southern China, but it's definitely not the main language. And um, that language itself is supported. Um, so if you have a language that you're interested, then please do check the API uh, to see if uh, it is something that supports out of the box. So let's switch it back. Okay. So which Android version support these two API? Can we have everyone standing up? Everyone stand up. Everyone, go on, exercise a little bit. Cool, thank you. All right, so if you think it's supported from Pi, sit down. Pi, Oreo, Nougat, Marshmallow, how about KitKat? Jelly bean? Is it jelly bean? <laughs> Ice cream sandwich. Okay, that's as far as I know, basically. <laughs> cool. All right, well, let's all sit down. Let me, let me tell you the answer. This is, this is an answer that shocked me a little bit. Um, so for, for Android recogni uh, recognizer, uh, sorry, speech recognizer, it was supported from Android for real onwards uh, from API level 8. And the first demo that we give the screen looks something like this. And for text-to-speech, it's even more shocking that it's actually 10 years ago at Google I.O. Uh, 2009 uh, that we announced it, and it was supporting API level 4. Uh, and I think it's Donut. I've actually got it written down. I didn't know. Um, so it is something that um, I would assume 100% of your user 
um, have access to. Um, but what you would find if you kind of go back and have a look at the video is that the speech quality have really improved. Um, basically, all these functionalities are being delivered uh, through APKs or via the Google Cloud uh, color services. So in the meantime, between uh, 2009 and today, uh, a lot of the speech quality, both in dictation and also in text-to-speech, have improved. So again, if you have a use case, please go ahead and try it. So what I'm going to show you uh, a little bit is the code snippet kind of behind what you've seen. Um, for speech recognizer, it looks something like this. So you uh, you need to uh, create a uh, recognition uh, listener uh, object. And in it, there are about eight different uh, methods that you need to override. Some of them are like, hey, begin of speech or end of speech. Um, but I will highlight maybe three methods that I think developers should really uh, pay attention to. So the first one is on partial result. Why would you want to pay attention to that? Hey, it's not the final result. Why should I pay attention to the partial result? Um, I would argue that when users are using dictation service, they really want to know whether something is happening or not. So any kind of clues they can give them and say, hey, I'm listening to you, and here is what I've heard, is going to be great. So something to uh, give them feedback on, uh, on, on basically what the microphone have captured. Um, and this is uh, the, the method to, uh, to essentially get that uh, partial result. And then you basically, this method will be called several times over the, uh, over the time period. So you can then update uh, what the uh, recognizer is um, dictating. The second is on RMS changed. Um, it wasn't really obvious to me what it actually meant when I first kind of looked at it. Uh, but what it meant is essentially uh, sound level. So if you have um, uh, noise, it go from uh, I think zero to one. Uh, I need I need to go back and check. Essentially, the different uh, uh, sound level. So what you can do is the um, the effect of kind of uh, the Google Assistant, whereby you know you can have animation that vary depending on the on the sound level. And again, this will give the user feedback on the fact that you know, your app is listening to them and it is kind of doing something, it is processing. And then finally, when you actually do get the result on result, um, then you'll get an array back and the first uh, object that you, uh, or the first element that you get back is the actual highest uh, confidence result. If you want the other result, if you, if you look at the, the app that I just uh, um, kind of show you, apart from the top result, it also have several kind of different result kind of underneath it. And, um, and if you're interested, you can basically iterate through the entire array, excuse me, to, um, to basically get those other results. Um, and then to use it, um, even on create, you basically need to in initialize the uh, speech recognizer and also the uh, speak intent. And again, the, the one that I will highlight is maybe the last two options. So one of them is saying, yes, please give me the partial results when you get them. And then the other one is specifying the language. So if you want to specify, uh, yeah, if, you, if you're dictating in a particular language, uh, please do say. And then finally, when you're ready, you essentially have the speech recognizer feeding in the intent, and away you go. So that's the code. Uh, for dictating. So you don't need to know anything about you know, voice dictation, etc. You just need to know how to use it. And that gives us uh, basically a lot of value. When I show this to um, a lot of the uh, ML developers, they go, hey, you know, I've developed a really superb text processing module or chatbot, but dictation is hard. Can you help us? And it's like, yes, please use this API. So you might be able to kind of take a huge shortcut if you're doing uh, something like that. Another thing that I want to uh, show is um, there are so many kind of different uh, machine learning um, paths and uh, well-trodden uh, kind of use cases that you can actually find a lot of these online. So this, in this example, what we're doing is essentially applying a style uh, to a particular image. So here we have uh, the source image, 
In the middle, we have the style that we, are, we want to apply. And then finally, we have uh, essentially the result that we want to get. And you can find this um, on, online um, saying, hey, can, I, can you help me with new style transfer? Um, and you will have something like this pop up. And this is something that I find invaluable. Uh, it's called a Colab. Um, it is, a, I guess, a Google Cloud offering, whereby you can get one of Google's machine in the cloud uh, with a GPU or maybe even a TPU and run it for free. Um, and uh, this particular style of notebook allows you to uh, have the text to describe what you're doing as well as the code. And then with the code, you don't actually need to download it to your local machine and run it. You can just click, and it will run it uh, in Google's data center. So you don't even need a powerful machine. And a quick thing to share is that at work, we do get kind of fairly powerful machines already. You know, I have a machine with a reasonable GPU and I think uh, 64 meg, meg of RAM. Um, when I'm running this, actually, this particular um, collab will run faster on Google's free GPU than on my machine. Um, so just something to bear in mind. Um, if, you, you know, if you see one of those, try it. Um, it's quite likely to be um, faster than kind of the, 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 the laptop that you're using. So give it a go. And then you, and then you might say, hey, you know, that's, that's all well and good. But what do I know, in, you know, in particular I, Hoi, know about machine learning? So let me just give you a real life example of me running this. Um, so this is my daughter. And I thought, hey, it would be really cool if um, I could have a pencil uh, sketch of her. So I run the uh, machine learning uh, model. And this is the first um, uh, output that I get. You'll notice that um, there's a lot of squares kind of around it, the image itself. And I go, wait, you know, that artifact actually doesn't exist in the source image or the style image. What's going on? And I go, well, maybe maybe the color image just didn't get the particular brush strokes correct. Maybe the uh, input is too low in terms of resolution. So the um, original algorithm is 500, 512 by 500, 512. So I thought, hey, maybe I could just double it and see what happens. Um, so I'll read through the code, because all the code is published in the Colab. Um, and I change the uh, maximum dimension uh, parameter. And this is the second attempt that I've got um, by doubling it. And you, and you can see that basically all the brush strokes are now correct, and all the squares are gone. So coming back to what I learned from this is you shouldn't expect yourself to be able to come up with the neural style transfer. And you shouldn't need to know basically how many layers, um, et cetera, in that model that you need and how to improve it. But what we will expect uh, developers to, to know and learn is that, hey, there are simple parameters that you can play around with. You know, would having a, a, a monochrome image change things, or will um, having a different dimension image change things? And those kind of things are very easy to read uh, from the code itself, um, I would argue. And you could change one or two parameters to basically get to um, a at least a better result, maybe the, not, the, not the perfect result that you want, but a much better result. And from this, I go, hey, you know, this is within my graphs of, um, of, of machine learning. So another thing uh, that we have recently announced is TensorFlow uh, 2.0 have gone alpha. Um, and with the new TensorFlow, we are aiming for easy uh, ease, to, ease of use and uh, but much more Python-like uh, kind of behavior, which means when you run a command, you get a result back. Um, but again, for me, the most important thing isn't actually that. The most important thing is actually having something like TensorFlow, which means that um, when I go online and I'm trying to search for something, then I go, oh, here's a TensorFlow collab that I can run. And as a result, I don't need to learn five or six or 10 different languages um, or have um, basically various platform setup, I could just kind of have the same thing kind of running over, uh, uh, running the same thing essentially over and over again. And what that helped me is to basically get started with the journey and getting to learn. Um, at least that's kind of how I find it. 
So, last but not least, machine learning le needs a lot of data. So hopefully, I've shown you that through this example, um, this is a very, very extreme example. Don't expect this to be repeatable everywhere. Um, where um, the algorithm was able to go, hey, here's one input image, and here's a style image, essentially a sample size of one, and produce the output. Um, this is rather extreme, um, but it is um, able to do that through something called transfer learning. Um, so the model itself isn't just trying to look at the two images um, and say, hey, here's a third, magic. Um, it is actually built on a third model um, that is called uh, VGG16, uh, which is able to uh, do some image analysis on the, uh, on the image itself, and it's trying to balance how much style it can apply to the image versus how much content, kind of the, the shape that you can read uh, from, the, from the resulting image. So it's trying to, trying to balance content and style. Um, and that particular model uh, is something that, if you look at the code, it download from uh, a repository. So when you, whenever you're seeing something that is called transfer learning, that is something that uh, essentially you're building your model on top of someone else's model. Um, and that someone else's model maybe something that's trained on millions or maybe even billions of data point. Um, and what it does is it kind of gives you a shortcut to your answer uh, to really help you to get to your result without waiting for days and months uh, for the data to process. So the um, example that I will encourage you to try is this one, uh, image labeling. Um, so this is called Tensorflow for Poet, uh, where the default um, uh, the default um, color differentiation between the different images are different types of flowers. Um, and it is so easy to use, I kid you not, one of the uh, product managers said, oh my god, this is so easy to use that even a product manager can do this. So please do give it a try um, and uh, let us know what you think. And I thought, hey, you know, that is good, but I need to try it before I can give a talk. Um, and last year, uh, one of the speakers here at Android Maker said, hey, I would like to do uh, strawberries or not. And I go, okay, great. Let me take up that challenge. Let me actually build the, the demo based on that. Um, but unfortunately, I was, um, I was prevented from doing this because MobileNet actually already have a category called strawberry, and it's number 951. So... It's rather simple if I want to do this, is to say, hey, why don't I just run MobileNet? And if it is strawberry, then it's fine, or others. So this kind of comes back to the earlier lesson that we've learned, is that, you know, hey, if someone else has built something that you can use, just use it. Um, so that will be the end of my talk. And I go, nah, you know, I actually know, I, I do actually want to take up this challenge and do this. So I thought, hey, why don't I just do something unique? I'll do Hoy or not. So, live demo. <laughs> Let's give it a go. Uh, where's the other window? Okay. Not the face contour. Okay, so the algorithm is thinking that I'm nine anywhere between 97 to 99% hoy, can you see that? I need a darker background. Okay. Cool. So you need, if you need, to, you need to turn your head a little bit, between 99 and 97, I literally just hacked this together. So um, can my two volunteers come over? Cool. So let's try this out and see what happens. All right. Whoa, okay, 98, 99%, thank you. Oh, this is, the, this is actually the lowest that I've seen. Um, so what I, um, yeah, basically what I've shown you there is um, some of my own failings. Um, let me just switch this off, cool. Um, the model actually is pretty good. 
at telling whether a person is in the picture. But it wasn't able to tell whether that person is me. Um, and I have been using uh, the current US president and the last US president uh, to check. And both of them are scoring over 90%. So you're doing extremely well for, as, a, as a unique uh, kind of person in my model. Um, and all of them is like getting over 90%. And I go, hey, what's wrong? You know, OK, let's go back to, to the data that I feed to the model. It's always garbage in, garbage out. So I did this, essentially. I picked 60 pictures of myself uh, from Google Photo. I just search and go, hey, let me download 60 of my beautiful pictures. And now I'll put it against other, which is another 3,000, around 700 uh, photos. And those photos I essentially get from the collab. Um, and I go, hey, that must be Hoy versus others, right? And it turned out that when I went through those 3,000 photos, and I did, um, only about 30 uh, of the photos, I got a little bit bored, so around 30 uh, photos have people in them. So as a result, the, the, uh, the model isn't so much kind of telling me apart from another person, but telling me apart from flowers. So unless <laughs> your face kind of look like a flower, maybe you are, <laughs> yay. Um, then it, the, the, um, the algorithm actually react pretty badly to, uh, um, to the input. So in reality, what, especially if you're building a model that is something or not, it's actually really hard. Because if you're thinking about something or not, it's basically something against the rest of the universe. Um, so anything out there could be not that particular category. So what I would suggest is if you are trying to build um, uh, or, or leverage the image labeling uh, collab, then I would suggest that you try to keep the uh, data set to, um, to a relatively small size and also handle the or not case a bit more gracefully than what I've done there. Um, some of the lessons I've learned is that you know, the data need to be relevant. So I only have my 60 pictures against what I thought was 3,000 other pictures, but it ended up being 30 uh, other pictures of people. Um, the second thing is um, try to control your environment. So if you have a conveyor belt that only kind of give you oranges and apple, this thing will be really good at telling them apart. But if anything can happen, then it is less so. And then the last thing is uh, transfer learning saves time and data. So yes, you know, in this example, I have failed to produce a um, security uh, device with my face unlock uh, to, uh, to a military standard, definitely not. Um, but at the same time, it actually produced a fairly good result for uh, a people detector um, in, the, in, in that. And if we look at other use cases. So one of my colleagues uh, used this to determine the different Lego figures that he had. And he basically started getting quite good results uh, with around 50 photos uh, for each of the categories. And when he gets to hundreds of photos, it actually becomes really good um, in terms of quality. So that's something that you know, perhaps, you can, uh, perhaps you can try. The other thing uh, about time is that um, because you're building on, on top of transfer learning, that means you don't need to actually train it on uh, millions of data points, uh, or rather you're building it on someone else's kind of work, on top of someone else's work. And uh, for this particular model, I only train it on my workstation in, say, two minutes, two and a half. Um, and so you can imagine that you know, with, uh, you know, with, let's say, a less powerful laptop, you know, it may be 10 minutes. But that's perfectly doable. It's not like, hey, I need to train this for a month. And then at the end of it, you realize, that, oh, I miss a, you know, I miss a colon somewhere. Um, it's nothing like that. It's actually quite uh, um, easy and uh, approachable from, from at least a posting power perspective. Um, so please do give it a go. So last lesson that I've learned is that actually, if there's something really simple that you can do, maybe machine learning is the wrong tool. Um, so here's a dialog box from uh, Gmail. They do not use machine learning uh, for this dialog box. You just say, hey, does the message contain attach? And if it does, does it have an attachment? 
And if it doesn't, it pops up this warning box and say, hey, are you sure? You say C attach, but there is no attachment. Um, and to me, that there are two lessons here. One is, you know, hey, if that's simpler and it achieves good result, do it. Second thing is, before you embark on a machine learning um, model um, or way of doing things, think about how you can do it in another way. And essentially use that as a benchmark and say, hey, is the improvement so much better that I'm willing to ship that extra megabyte of model or five megabyte or 10 megabyte um, or devolve like, you know, two, three weeks of my development uh, resource, you know, into this? Um, because this is not cost free. You know, it is a new thing and it will, um, and it is a trade off. So think about, you know, basically having something that is not machine learning as being the benchmark and try to beat it with your machine learning model. Um, so just a quick review. Uh, hopefully you agree with me. Some of the myths are not true. Uh, the first one is I think Android uh, is ready for on device machine learning. Um, the second is a lot of these use cases, be it custom model or not, uh, do not actually require PhD. And also the, the number of data points that you need is perhaps l a lot less than you think. And just to preview, at Google I.O., um, we'll have around six talks that um, if you're interested in Android machine learning, I encourage you to attend. Um, so the second talk, uh, I'll be uh, involved where we talk about some of the latest uh, development in Android machine learning. Um, and you will also notice that two of the talks are designed. So designed for human-centered AI products and then ML kit um, and material design, uh, design pattern for mobile machine learning. So those are uh, new, I would say. And, um, and finally, since the cat is out of the back, uh, a lot of the uh, image processing rely on the camera API. Um, and we have uh, the Camera X Jetpack library talk uh, on the second day. So if you're interested in image processing, again, I would strongly encourage you to uh, take a look at that talk as well. Um, so that's me done. And I'll be around to take questions afterwards outside. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I actually bought these cute little bottles of water. <laughs> so yeah, if you want one. Sorry. Hey. <laughs>